Barbara Tanze. Did, Yay! I, did I? Did I nail it? Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> well, hey, perfect. Barbara, thanks for uh, for first of all jumping on the podcast with us. As I'm already excited to uh, to to knock it out with you, and I didn't want to. We had to press record because we were going to get into breathing and coaching, talking right away. So, so I want to save that yeah. for the actual podcast and let you let it rip. But uh, really cool to connect with you rather quickly. And then to tie across, I've had a few podcasts with people across the uh, across the world, and and it's always really fascinating to me that we are way different time zones, way different spectrums, and we just it's weird to connect with people who you're very passionate about, very similar things, and and find that alignment. So first and foremost, thanks for jumping on, thanks for connecting with me pretty quickly about something that I, I'm very excited to dive in with you specifically. But uh, more so than anything, let's have a fun little uh, conversation. It's nice to uh, meet you yeah. over the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, and thank you, thank you so much for reaching out to me because I, I enjoy talking about this more than anything in the world. I think yeah. this is something that really I feel that we we all share this passion and that drive. And mm -hmm. what I love in the kind of breathing community, at least the people that I'm in contact with, is this kind of support and the whole you know we all understand that this is a fight that's really worth being fought yeah. because we want to bring more awareness into whatever field of life that we are more you know working on but it's so important wherever what whoever we work with it's just so important to get that awareness yeah. to the people that breathing really is the base of everything and the way you breathe just has an impact on everything you do no matter if yeah if whether you play hockey or whether you sing opera or right. if you're like if you do beatboxing yeah. or it really doesn't matter well said i mean that is powerful right out of the gate so i mean uh, and i couldn't agree more and it's it's another one that's wild is it is insane to i don't know why there's that connection in the breathing world of what you just said but like i said right away from talking to you and just kind of having an idea and you can feel that passion when i hear you speak and i follow some of your stuff and what you do teach it's almost like you can feel that through people which is a really wild concept i, I know you know what i'm talking about i don't really know how to explain yeah. it deeper than that but but that's sort yeah. of uh sort of the idea of, and you just kind of hit it too but just to before we get going and i'll start peeling into you with some questions but can you give an idea uh and some substance for those who are going to listen now we have a lot of our listeners are you know, coaches, athletes, and, and in that world, right? And and uh, actually, we have a, a musician uh, who, who does a little bit of breathing work with us too, but he's a former athlete, so I can't necessarily take the, the vocal. Maybe I'll, I'll send him your way in this concept. But uh, just to kind of create an idea of what you do specifically, uh, layer that in, and then let's let it rip and, and dive into the depths of breathing. Yeah, so I my approach to breathing or how I started to get into this is – because I'm an opera singer or I was in my yeah. former life. I was yeah. a professional opera singer. And of course, breathing is really important for singers. I usually say that singing is the most beautiful way to exhale, which, you know, then depending on the person can, yeah. But it's, it is, it is. And it's, um, and I got really interested in it because after I turned 30, my body was, was just not regenerating as well as it was before that. And so I started feeling that just something was off, something wasn't right. I, I, I always had the feeling that things should be much easier, mm -hmm. like they were so much easier before. And so I started diving into that whole breathing. And it just so happened that at the time, a former um, study friend of mine that I, that I studied with at the Academy of Music in Lausanne, Switzerland, that's where I studied, mm -hmm. um, he had kind of developed a method from the work of Carl Stau. Carl Stau has been now a, like a prominent player in James Nestor's new book, Breathe. Mm -hmm. So James Nestor kind of rediscovered also the work of Carl Stau. And Carl Stau was also a singer. And that's how there, there was a connection was, uh, was made. And so this um, colleague of mine had started to take Carl Stau's work and make that into... Um, a method that would be possible to teach and to train people. Wow. And so, of course, I jumped on that opportunity. And so I studied that for four years. And this method is really all about um, 
manually trying to re-coordinate rib cage and diaphragm. Wow. So it's, it's all about mechanics. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't learn anything about physiology. I didn't learn anything about nasal breathing in that method, but what, for what it was to really understand and manually being able to unblock ribs, um, find limitations in the rib cage and try to re-coordinate the movement of the ribs and the diaphragm it's just it's really really good yeah and because carl stout was a singer mm -hmm. and also uh, robin de haas this guy that i then worked with he is also he is also a singer um this then also of course connects really well with the voice and how the voice is of course an integral part of our breathing mechanism yeah. which maybe for athletes yeah it's a bit less evident than it is for singers mm -hmm. but carl stout did work with athletes so he did um, trained some um, some uh, athletes of the athletics teams for for the 1968 Olympic Games. Wow! Yeah. And had a lot of success with that. And so, when I started training in that method, I kind of dug that out, and I was like, "Hey, that would be so interesting to work in that way with like on breath mechanics for athletes." Because I used to be a competitive swimmer when I was in my teens. Yeah. Another even two lives ago, <laughs> and then. Yeah. And then I started to swim again and now I'm, I'm kind of, but like very slowly getting into those like triathlons and things, but I'm really interested in efficiency. Like, I don't want to just, you know, I don't know, go crazy and like get myself all worked up about stuff. I want to understand what's happening yeah. and I want to be efficient. I don't care if I'm fast. Sure. I want to be efficient. Sure. And so. Sure. And so now I'm trying to bring that kind of body mechanics work, um, which I then also kind of upgraded with. I also worked with Brian McKenzie yeah. and Rob Wilson and did the art of breath. And then, um, of course, read the oxygen advantage and all of that kind yeah. of stuff and kind of build all that together because I think it's so compatible. You know, if you manage to find optimal mechanics then all the rest is so much easier. It all comes together. You know, the whole nasal breathing, it's going to be so much less frustrating for a person who has mobile ribs where really the lungs can expand easily and where their diaphragm is well coordinated with the rib cage. And so, yeah, now, right now I'm trying to build all of that stuff together yeah. and find people who want to do that with me. <laughs> yeah, that is freaking awesome. <laughs> I, uh, you know, my, uh, I, there's a lot to unpack in there, but my first thing that just came at the end of what you were just saying is when you're looking at like a singer, you know, I'll, I'll ask that later, but for more so when you look at mechanics, you look at the diaphragm, you look at the mobility of the rib cage, is that something that you're, when you first meet somebody? So if I, if I come to you, whoever I am, singer, athlete, anybody really, if I come to you, are you like tracking me, measuring me, or are you just like studying how I breathe? Like how's the first initial idea of for you to get an idea of my body and maybe try to pick up on the history of maybe the movement, obviously the movements I already programmed in my body before I even meet you. Yeah. So I will do a manual assessment of how well your ribs are moving. Okay. So that's really straight out of Carl Stau's yeah. playbook. So I don't know as really, I know who you're talking about in that sense. Like I've read about yeah. him and I read that book, James Nestor. So I know the name, but I, that's why it's so interesting to me because this yeah. background is, I, I don't know that much about Carl Strau in that, in that world. Yeah. So he was really a master of getting ribs to move well. Wow. And in order to get ribs to move well, and this is where the voice comes in and how, how this really connects. Mm -hmm. See, our vocal folds are really part of our breathing mechanism, first of all, because the vocal folds in the evolution of our body were not meant to make us able to be able to speak. Wow. But the vocal folds are basically the last kind of possibility to close off something so that food or drink or anything that shouldn't fall into our lungs, that shouldn't fall down our trachea, can be blocked here. Mm -hmm. And so every one of us who has, you know, I don't know, try to drink something and it went into the wrong hole, yeah. right into the trachea instead of the, the esophagus knows that then the vocal folds will close and we'll start to cough. And yeah. so this is, this is basically why we have those vocal folds. Sure. And only, 
And only later on did it, with, with the um, uh, development of the brain, did it happen that we are now able to use them in such a way that we can articulate, that we can do different pitches, yeah. all that kind of wow. stuff. Wow, okay. But it's still, the vocal folds are still right in here. So if you kind of touch your neck right here behind the Adam's apple, yeah. Yeah, you can, that's <laughs> your larynx. Yeah, you can kind of move it. It's kind of freaky it's almost. Fun. It, it is. And sometimes it kind of makes little cracks. Yeah, that's what mine just did. It scared me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's OK. That's OK. So um, the larynx here, the, the voice box where mm -hmm. the, the vocal folds are in. Right. Basically, what happens when we make a sound, when I when I inhale or exhale silently, my vocal folds are open, kind of like like my fingers are now. Mm -hmm. OK. And so when I make a sound, the vocal folds will approximate, will come together and start to vibrate. So they will open and close depending, well, this, the, how fast they open and close is depending on the pitch that I want to, that I want to produce. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So usually we, well, we count that in Hertz. Okay. So usually, usually when we have like a middle A, which would be the kind of pitch that a violin would 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 do is would uh, tune itself with a piano or something like this yeah that's this sound right here uh -huh. so for that sound if i do like mm -hmm. this height yeah, yeah and you would do it an octave lower yeah but if i on this height my vocal folds touch each other 440 times in one second wow okay so they, they'll just flap like really really quickly yeah okay and that's that so i mean is that what, am I understanding that right? Is that why I have that vibration? Is that what that's doing? Yes. Okay. That's how the, the frequency kind of starts here. Then the sound that comes out is being then also amplified still here in the resonance space. So okay. the sound that we would get purely from the vocal folds is not very strong. And it's kind of sounds a little bit like mosquito-ish. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. can't do it. I can't do it for you because I can't rip out my larynx. No, you know? no, but I got, I got, no, you're explaining it right. right? I, I understand what you're saying. I think it, it, <laughs> it, it's like, it's a, it's a buzz. Yeah. It's a buzz, yep. but then we can amplify it. And each person then of course has different resonance spaces, which is why everybody has a different color of voice. Oh, wow. But what I want to say with this is that when the vocal folds close and open, what they do is they cause a resistance to the airflow. So mm -hmm. I'm exhaling, but I'm exhaling with the vocal folds kind of closing and opening, closing and opening, closing and opening. Yeah. Which creates a pressure, of course, underneath the vocal folds. Okay. Yeah. And so that pressure, of course, then goes back. That's Newton's third law of motion. So it's action reaction. It goes back into the direction that it came from, which means that while we are speaking or while we make a sound, our rib cage is under pressure. There's a pressure inside our rib cage that builds up. All right. So let me say that back to you. So if I sing, speak, whatever that is, and that's vibrating, the mm -hmm. backdrop of that is a pressure now coming down, which is what's yeah. pressurizing. Okay. So as I'm singing a note, the hmm, like there's now pressure in the rib cage. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I got it. I so, got it. <laughs> and you can, you, what you can do is you can put your hands on your rib cage yeah. and do, and do, mm, and then mm. let that mm, kind of go into a, just exhale and you'll feel that the rib cage kind of like, yeah, yeah. Wow. It does. Mm, mm. You feel it does. Yeah. Why? Okay. Yeah. So okay. that's, and that's the negative pressure, right? Or the reaction coming down. Well, it's, it's a pressure that comes from like just restricting the, the airflow. The airflow, right. Yep. Okay. That is right? crazy. And so this, of course, that pressure is going to have an impact on our rib cage. Yeah. But also there's going to be, of course, a continuation of that also in our core muscles, especially in the transverse abdomen and in the pelvic floor. So basically when we use our voice, there is this pressure that is happening and that needs to be managed by the entirety of our rib cage and of our core muscles. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And so this is something that Carl Stau really understood. He didn't yet really understand like so much the physics behind it, but sure. he just intu intuitively understood that this is really important because sure. what we need to look at in there is of course, the diaphragm is right in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I have yeah. a nice. No, it's an unbelievable shirt. I should have one on so, too. <laughs> yeah, 
Isn't it awesome? So you can imagine you ha I have my diaphragm here inside my rib cage. And of course that pressure that is pushing down, it also has an impact on my diaphragm. Yeah. Okay. So the medical community is still a little bit um, divided into if the diaphragm is able to actually have an eccentric contraction or not. Yeah. It seems very logical, but there is no like scientific proof of it yet. Well, so and that's what I was wondering, because if I exhale and the diaphragm goes back up and I'm singing, because if I'm singing, I'm exhaling, correct? Yeah. And yes. so then the diaphragm is pressurizing up, but then the from the throat down, it's pressurizing down. Okay. Well, so what does so that do if I'm singing for hours? Maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself with this question, but like, what's, is that would be the fatigue? Like, wouldn't you, is that what, is that what training singing is, is like trying to strengthen your body to handle that pressure? Because essentially, aren't you just pounding pressure on pressure? No, because it's not, it's not that much pressure. Okay. I mean, it's not, okay. no, we're not, we're not talking, you know, that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. pressure. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very flexible, subtle pressure because it's not like a complete closure. It's constantly vibrating. So okay. it, it's, it's very like a flexible kind of pressure. But yes, singers absolutely need to learn how to be able to manage that pressure in the entirety of their rib cage and their abdominal space. And many of them, um, Many of those who have issues with their voice, you know, they might get like um, nodules sure. or, or problems with their voice. Yeah. Very often their body is not doing this in a very efficient or coordinated way. So they'll, yeah, you know, as soon as, 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 a, as a part of the system is not, um, is not managing that pressure well, then another part will have to compensate for that. And this, of course, then creates again, can create too much pressure under the vocal folds. And then mm -hmm. the vocal folds have to start to kind of um, strain more. And so everything falls apart. So that's, that's a big, big part of my work sure. is to teach people how to understand all that stuff that's going on underneath their vocal folds. That is but, wild. Do they teach that? Do you just, is that like a specialty or do they teach that early on? Like how is the process of learning how to sing? I wouldn't even know where to start. No, 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 no. It's, it's unfortunately, it's really rare. Like I'm, I was really lucky to work with Robin De Haas, who, mm -hmm. who was really one of the first people who really defined what is happening. Mm -hmm. And, and then what I'm doing, I'm kind of building on that and I kind of, developed a whole tool which is working with a balloon and i saw this yeah think, go ahead yeah, yeah. Which, which i think you know athletes would use balloons and that's also how i got that i yeah. got that from from the art of breath yeah yeah where they use balloons as like kind of a spirometry kind of like a little test how yep. well you can exhale yeah and then when i did this i was like whoa but wait a second this makes me feel so much everywhere and i could really start to feel and, and become aware of all the different muscles like the transverse abdominis and the pelvic floor and how everything kind of connects together For sure. and so yeah. i've been training singing teachers to work with a balloon in order to, to not overdo the abdominal pressure because this is what happens very very often mm -hmm. Um, with singers who are beginning, they have like a problem with squeezing their squeezing th their abs too much, which creates too much pressure, and then the voice gets really tired. Sure. And, and I think that there's also there's this connection with the athletic world because you see, we all want to have a strong diaphragm, right? Right. Because a strong diaphragm is what's gonna really be the you know the the big guy, the, yeah. The thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, of course, we can use all of those gadgets, you know, those spiral tigers and yeah. all those kind of outside restrictions. But we have an inbuilt restriction right here that is, that is just so the cool. perfect. It's, it's made for each body, you know. Yeah. So your question before was awesome. You know, can yeah. we get like really tired and strained? I think when we use an outside gadget, it's much easier to get strained by this than if you use your voice and you try to coordinate that entire system so that the voice and the diaphragm and the rib cage and all of those things really work together. 
and you can actually hear in people's voices if they're breathing well. Well, so, and so, that's, okay, so that's something to, I mean, it's crazy because I feel like the next concert, hopefully the world allows us to go back to concerts here soon, but it's like, uh, I wonder, so if you, cause if you're on tour, I know a couple people who, you know, go on tour, obviously you do too. And it's like, you look at that, that they sing every night and then they practice like during the day too, right? Like they do sound check, all those sort of things. So you're singing all the time and you're doing that for months on end. So like, what's the fatigue or what's the, I mean, I don't even know, like if you sing so late into the night and then the next day you have to do that again, like what's the strength and conditioning of being a singer? Like, is your main focus just on this vocal side? Is that probably across the board? Is that the majority of the training or the the priority to make sure that this is on? Because if you're just hammering that all night, do do you ever do you notice like at the end of concerts or the end of shows or even yourself like do you notice if this gets fatigued maybe your pitch maybe not to someone like me who's like in the audience going this is just great no matter what I don't hear anything different but do you notice your sound sounding worse when you're fatigued or how do you get through those oh yeah of course you know the vocal folds are really really tiny yeah yeah so they um I mean they are really depending on the rest of the body doing a good balanced job. And that's the diaphragm, what you're saying. And the, that, exactly. The that's like the whole pre- pressure management and okay. then the resonant, resonant management. So we always want to sing with like maximum efficiency and minimal effort. Mm. And if we, do, if we do that, we can actually, the voice is totally able to produce something quite impressive with almost no strength or like no strain because acoustics are helping us. Oh, sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So we need to, we need to learn how to, yeah, have mechanically have everything kind of in a good balance and then to ride the acoustics, you know, ride the resonance. And, and, and there's probably then also still a difference, you know, if you are doing opera or if you're doing any kind of, um, contemporary singing where you actually you are amplified so you have a microphone mm-hmm. so those are then different different ways of singing of yeah. course but at the end of the day yeah well singers you know singers usually tend to get very protective of their voice and you'll see them you know walking around with scarves yeah. the whole winter and <laughs> yeah and, yeah well now and, i respect it a lot more <laughs> you know, yeah, now that i know it, that it actually really <laughs> makes sense but yeah. The thing is, when it comes to voice and and also breathing, I think this is where voice and breathing are kind of similar, is that we do not yet have a lot of evidence-based models on, you know, the voice is something so complex Mm -hmm. that there is not a lot of evidence-based information. So education in singing very often, especially when it comes to classical singing, opera singing is still a lot based on just um, um, the professor who taught the professor who taught the professor and you know so there's a lot of kind of like there are a lot of myths and a lot of you have to feel it like this and you have to do it like this and what i'm trying is to kind of translate that you know that you should they're like weird things like you should be feeling like there's an apple in your throat you know because that has to be large yeah but but at the end of the day, I'm trying to translate that into how each singers would feel that for themselves. I get right? that. Yeah. So a question I have there is what's the hardest style of singing? Like is opera is uh, I guess I wouldn't like is like heavy, me- you know what I mean? Like what's the most difficult on the voice? And then I guess the question I would have on that is like, what's the what's the like career length of a singer? Like what's a, like if you play 10 years in the major league baseball or the NFL in the NFL, that's like unheard of. Right. So like your body is such a small window of opportunity or baseball, you know, you have such small windows of opportunity. And I feel like that'd be the same with singers, right? Like if you hit it big when you're 25, do you, do you have a 10 year career? Can you have a 40 year career? Because then I look at it as, your career would essentially be like, if you make it as a singer and you know, you're good enough and you can take care of this, you should be able to do this for as long as you want. Right. 
Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, what's the Again, yeah? Take me through kind of like the history or the ba- like what that looks like in a career spectrum. Again, I think there's a difference between like contemporary and yeah. operas because. Uh, operatic voice is something that needs a long time to develop. So okay. at 25, um, depending on what voice type you are, but 25 would be like typically the beginning of like even going to work to as an opera singer. Ah, yeah, I see. That would, be, that would be when you would have your first kind of big concerts or you would have your first roles in an opera house. And yeah. you should probably... Like in a typical career, probably the peak years would be between 35 and 45. Really? Wow. That's really cool. Well, so because feeding into that, I was going to ask you if I'm singing and I'm getting off CO2, obviously we have kind of the CO2 background and I know you do a lot of stuff with that too. So I just look at it as like if if you're a salesperson or a teacher and you talk all the time, you get super fatigued, right? Because you're getting rid of so much CO2. So as a singer, that's got to be the same do you get rid of that much CO2 as talking or how does that well, look? Because yeah, you take it and run. Well, are you, that's a question for you. Are you really offloading so much CO2? Because well, now that you know, yeah. now that you know the vocal folds are closing, basically you're not exhaling. That much, would you be know? my, from what you just told me, that would be my hypothesis, which doesn't really sound like a hypothesis. It sounds kind of concrete now. It's like, I wouldn't really get rid of, CO2, it's like uh, if I do like a hum or a hiss, like I can go really long, yep. right? Because I'm just kind of constricting yep. that. So, if, but if I'm, so if I'm singing, I'm not getting in because I'm still constricting that. So that's not comparable to talking. So you could get more is like, if I'm just talking like this, is my vocal cord or is that as tight compared to singing? Well, the only difference really is that your vowels are shorter. Oh, okay. So you know, you, you won't do long notes like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But for the rest, also when you speak, it should be the same thing. You know, okay. your rib cage and everything should work in the same way. And your vocal folds should be closing well mm-hmm. and your resonance should be working well. And this is where it's so interesting to work also with people who are not singers, but yeah, people who use their voice, like you said, teachers or salespeople, yeah or even athletes, you know, or coaches who sometimes need to really go there and really be very loud. For sure. But they they also need to kind of learn how to be loud in order not to strain their vocal folds because the vocal folds here are definitely the weakest link. Yeah. And what I do see in some people is that if they have strained their breathing and that includes the vocal folds for a long time and they've abused of it for too long, and you can get something that's called um, dysphonia. It can be like a functional a spasmodic, for example, dysphonia, where the vocal folds, all of a sudden, they kind of go into like a tilt. Mm-hmm. And it can even happen that then they, like neurologically, something goes completely out of hand and they don't understand anymore if you're inhaling or exhaling and they might close on your inhale, which is not what wow. you want to have, right? What would that yeah. be? What would that, what happen if you, that closed on your, would you just stop oh, singing? You, like, you just... can try that. That's not for, that's not singers. Singers don't, well, singers get that kind of dysphonia, but athletes get that much more than singers. Sure. Do you feel yeah. like when oh. you watch somebody, so let's say I come to you and I'm like a, I'm a protege, you know, singer and I've got all this talent, but maybe I'm anxious in general, uh, or I'm like an over breather or a mouth breather or any sort of like neck vertical auxiliary type breather. Is that something that because if I take that and then go into, so again, this is just, I have no idea the answer to this, but this is for you in the sense of it do, if I come to you a little nervous, a little over breathing already, and then I sing for a few hours, do, do you notice people feel even more anxious after singing because they're amplifying like an already high respiratory rate? And it's just like a shot in the dark of a thought that I'm having as I'm listening to you speak. Actually, usually people tend to get calmer when they sing. Really? Well, I think I've heard that too. Why is that? Because they prolong their exhales. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's really cool. Is that why singing in the shower is so fun? (laughs) Yeah, and that's why people like if if they go 
to like a choir practice once a week and after that pra- choir practice they feel so good yeah is because you know when you sing usually you have phrases that are like clearly defined how long you need to hold that phrase and usually those phrases are longer than what th- those people would usually breathe especially if they're mouth breathers sure so sure. that will really take their respiratory frequency down Wow, that makes so much sense. And so how much of your work is breath work? Obviously, you have your skill set and your coaching and teaching, but do you do you focus like a priority on the breath work? Do you have a pre, during, or post breath work type of vibe, I guess, or teaching? Yeah, I, I mean, all my singing lessons start with breath work. Okay. So they'll lie down on the massage table yeah. and we'll figure out how they're doing today and if there is anything, you know, any kind of little rib thing that we need to fix. I also have a certificate in laryngeal massage. Oh, nice. So that's basically um, really how to, um, yeah, how to find out what stuff is stuck in here and how to get that to unstuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So we'll work, so we'll work on that a lot because you see, it really helps them to come down a little bit from whatever they've done in the day and if I if I just had them walk through the door and just said, OK, and now you sing. Yeah, it's like, whoa, you know, no, no violinist right. who has like a really good violin would just, you know, come in through the door and like open the violin case and like, you know, cut some bread on the violin and yeah. then start to play it. You know, it's yeah. our voice or our bodies are being used for so many different things. And we can't just expect from our nervous system and our mechanics to go from, you know, running and having a stressful day into this kind of really subtle coordination that we need in order for the body to be an instrument. At least that's how I see it. So we spend a good deal of time working on, yeah, calming down the nervous system. It it kind of comes along with the whole breath mechanics work. And so then what it does, it is saves me a lot of time in warming up their voice. Sure. You know, like the, the typical singing, like me, 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 those kind of exercises. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I do not need to do so many. I can really go like straight to the point. We can work very focused on exactly what the issue is or what the need is of that singer. And uh, so I, it, I think I would never go back to teaching voice lessons without that wow that's and, powerful and, that's powerful well you said it, it yeah go ahead go ahead sorry yeah so also when i work with athletes yeah i make them use their voice as well not necessarily singing wise okay. but i will definitely build voice in in the carl stow kind of way yeah. build the voice into in into what they do because like I said, it's something you have always with you. And if you know how to use um, a really well-coordinated hum yeah. in, your bre- in your breath work, so it's not just any kind of hum, you know, it's not just like a hmm, like this, but it's really, mm, can you hear the difference? Yeah. Like, is there's a real difference between a mm, well-coordinated hum mm-hmm. and just doing hmm or hmm, you know? where you'd lose much more air. Yeah. So, so I, I really work with the athletes on that as well so that they can kind of also start to redeve- redevelop or develop their diaphragm using the pressure from within because that's where we want to go, right? We want to use that pressure yeah. and make it, it's our friend. It really helps us to stabilize things to, um, and, and really that's the only way we have to really influence our diaphragm because we can't go in there that much right? yeah so I, so you that's a that's really cool this is really fascinating to me and it just from hearing it from a perspective of singing is beautiful and how much that does correlate to athletes and, and you're so right right like it's because if you tell an athlete hey we're gonna sing and they've never sang before you're probably not gonna get them you know yeah so but <laughs> If you tell them that and, hey, I can massage using this pressure to massage the top of the diaphragm, like I'm I'm invested now. Right. But so if I do like because I can massage manually the bottom of this diaphragm and I can get in there and pull stuff in there. Yeah. And I've never. Yeah. And I've never thought about that really from the top aspect. And that makes so much sense using the pressure 
to kind of go down. Now, do you find the pressure being most optimal with humming or is there like, is the hissing or what sort of the best massaging or, you know, pressuring from the top side down, I guess, uh, on the diaphragm that you find? Well, um, Carl Stau, he mm -hmm. used counting. So he would make people count. So I've been using so a lot of that too. I that like would that be a lot. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, and so on. And so basically you can tell then so much, you know, by having this kind of coordinated voiced exhale, meaning that there is pressure building up in the rib cage, okay. but the diaphragm is still slowly moving up and you yeah. have, and the ribs are moving. And if you have this entire pressurized system working optimally, you can do, you could go 15 times to 10. Yeah. With yeah. No problem. Maybe 20, if, you know, especially if you have a, um, a large lung, uh, lung capacity. So yeah, that, that, that is how Carl Stout was working also with the athletes for the Olympics in 1968. Yeah. And it's, I find that really, really efficient, even though in the beginning, maybe people are going to be like, what, what are you making me do? But, sure. but it really works. It works voiceless and voiced. The thing then that it, this is why I said I haven't at all, when I was training in that method, worked on nasal breathing, because of course that's all mouth, mouth breathing yeah. and especially the exhale is always going to be through the mouth, but yeah. with, with the resistance of the vocal folds. So I've been now recently kind of trying to understand how maybe we can um, still do the inhale nasal and then work on the exhale. I think that sure. Carl Stout, yeah. from, what I, from what I know about him, and I, I researched a lot about him because I wrote his Wikipedia article a long, like a couple of years ago. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, and I read his book and I watched his, his documentaries, yeah. oh, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, something that he said, and that really stayed in my mind and kind of resonates with me now that I think so much about CO2 mm -hmm. and CO2 tolerance mm -hmm. in his mind. And that we need to, we need to know that he passed away in the year 2000. So he, a lot of the research that is happening now, yeah. of course, he couldn't know. Right. But he felt that the biggest problem that we have nowadays is the CO2 buildup in people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you see, he had, there's something that he hadn't yet understood about like the relationship between CO2 and oxygen, I think. I mean, I can't ask him now because yeah. of, obviously I can't. Yeah, yeah. But, since he said that in his documentary that the biggest problem is the CO2 buildup. And so he basically worked on making people exhale, 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 exhale. Okay. Very slowly and very, in a very controlled manner, thank God. But I think there, if we combine that now with everything that we know about the CO2 tolerance and everything, then it gets really interesting, even though he was a little bit on, I think he was a little bit on like a wrong kind of in a wrong kind of direction yes sure. exhaling is really important sure but he i i'm not sure also that he really understood the importance of nasal breathing and i think he did not know about nitric oxide yeah. and all this because that was already pretty late in his life i yeah. mean so well it's just really interesting to yeah. put that stuff together because mechanically and working with a voice that's really cool that really yeah. makes so much sense yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, and in, in so I mean, keep hammering home on those mechanics when you kind of talk about that pressure build up. Obviously, the CO two build up and those sort of things. You mentioned earlier about the pelvic floor, which is uh, it's like the hardest thing to try to understand, right? In terms of like, is it working? Am I using it correctly? And then even trying to correlate in your mind that breathing is all the way down in your pelvis is insane. But so when you talk about building pressure down on top of the diaphragm. Is there, yeah. and I, again, from your point of view and what you teach, do you talk about pressure coming up from the pelvic floor and then now pushing from on the bottom of the diaphragm? What is singing or vocal cords or anything from that aspect that you found to work or cueing that you found to help people from kind of using the pelvic floor and, or anything that you kind of have utilized from now the bottom up? Yeah. So in my, in my understanding, mm -hmm. Everything that's below the diaphragm, below that pressure that builds up in the rib cage, mm -hmm. 
basically we need to stabilize that you know yeah we need to it needs to it needs to co coordinate in order to be able to like make create like a really stable foundation for everything that happens on top mm -hmm. why is that because when we are slowly we are slowly exhaling while we are phonating while we have while we're using our voice okay. we really want that to happen again we want that to happen very you know 360 degrees yep. kind of very in a very balanced manner because if we start to kind of push in here too much and here we're not or you know we really want the diaphragm to to relax to go up um in a very balanced way right and if we if we for example like we squeeze our our um our rectus abdominis too much then that's just going to keep everything from being able you know to release slowly upwards sure yeah or it, it, the same thing, if we if we squeeze our pelvic floor too hard, then things there are just not going to be able to like respond to that very subtle difference in pressure that happens. You know, even if even as I'm speaking to you now, because we have um, voiced consonants, unvoiced consonants in, in like an S when I say S, right? Yeah. My vocal folds are opening. That's why we don't have a sound on that. Oh, but of wow. course that that changes the pressure that changes everything down here yeah and we need something to kind of stabilize that stabilize the whole system and just make it possible that it's very very responsive and subtle and which which means that we need this to always be flexible and so this is why i really love working with the balloon because yeah. it creates a very um, nice resistance so okay. if we blow up if we blow into the balloon yeah just that much. We don't need to really blow it up, but just that much. Basically, we can feel pressure building up and we can feel it till the pelvic floor. So if you don't have a balloon with you right now, you can do it by um, by inflating your cheeks. You can do like this. And you you you, you just let oh, a little yeah. bit of just gonna... like we, we just blow some air yeah. out like you know yeah. kids would do. yeah and so now that you're sitting can you feel anything in your pelvic floor i feel pretty i mean i feel the pressure on that build up but my pelvic yeah. floor yeah just it's pretty nice right yeah there is something that is responding to that restriction right here yeah it's kind of crazy how it happens like con like simultaneously it's like and then you go, yeah. whoa <laughs> i can feel that too but 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 <laughs> But you agree, right? That you yeah. didn't like think I have to do something no. with my pelvic. No, not at all. Not at all. It, it really is a response to what's yeah. happening here. And yeah. so you can really feel how that pressure, it goes all the way down. And yeah. what I find super cool is yeah. that, you know, the pelvic floor is parallel to the diaphragm, right? Yeah. Which is what, yeah. Wild. Right. And so, and so in my, in my mind, at least, um, what I feel in my pelvic floor must be happening exactly the same to my diaphragm, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just kind of working parallel. together. And yeah. the force, the kind of the force is working downward yeah. and in the abdominals, abdominal wall is working a little bit outward, of mm -hmm. course, because, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, so that is super fascinating. I, I love to think about all those things and, um, and make people experience that and gain awareness of of all of those muscles that we like most singers do not have an awareness of all those muscles well so and now if i think about singing you know if you're playing the piano or if you're standing up with a microphone or maybe i'm standing up playing a guitar or i'm playing the you know a violin or what's the big one you know, uh the uh, the harp like a, a cello or a bass yeah uh, harp, yeah uh, harp. yeah there's just like yeah. all these sort of movements and like there's so many things that could manipulate your movement in in music i feel like there's way more than that than any sport really because there's so many different ways to move so it's like how do your yeah. mechanics shift if i'm just singing with a microphone and i just have like a pole i'm holding on to or maybe i'm just holding on to the actual microphone or i'm sitting at the piano or I have the big harp, or I have the guitar. Like there's so many angles where I could almost be disrupting mobility. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how you'd be able to correlate consistency if you're not mechanically sound, right? Because you're going to be pressurizing differently. Exactly. 
Yeah. Exactly. And that in in those all of those cases, the vocal folds are the weakest link. They're they're probably going to be the first one to go. And then that's what you're saying. If that goes, we're gonna you're just gonna start depleting as a performer. Well, when that goes, then you know you your voice will not sound the same, and sure. it's or sometimes it hurts. Yeah. Or um, I work with quite a few people who have nodules, and we're working on like really re basically reprogramming the entire system. So first, like really try to understand, try to gain awareness mm -hmm. of what's going on, really understand if there's anything mechanical that is not working in a balanced way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, as soon, especially if you go into like asymmetric kind of instrument playing. Yeah. Um, this is not a problem as long as everything is is flexible and mobile but as soon as we go into i think that's really the same for like doing um like if you do any weightlifting or yeah. crossfit or that, yeah you know as soon as you go into like an automated movement and you don't you know and, and it's a slightly off but you 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 constantly repeat that same movement but sure. it's it's slightly off yeah it means that you're compensating somewhere else and of course working with pressure pressure is a big friend of ours but it's also merciless because it's just physics yeah you know it, so it's cool. gonna go it's yeah. gonna go where it's gonna go yeah 100%. and it, and you can't get, just get rid of it or something you have to you have to work with it and so this is, I think, really important for all of those athletic coaches out there yeah. who need to scream really loudly, you know, for sure. that, they learn, that they learn how to use that pressure and the resonance and not be screaming their vocal folds out. You know, it can happen if like in rare cases when we are really, really abusing the vocal folds, you can have um, hemorrhaging vocal folds and that's really not what you want. Then you'd start to, like spit blood and that's not oh. good. That is wild. So, I mean, do you do, do you do, do you try to be pretty particular with your breath work? Like, could you overdo breath work and then not be as prepared for singing or is there not an overdue uh, situation? I'm just trying to nah. think like if you do a lot of breath holds or if you do, you know, any sort of like tumo or anything like that, like it doesn't really matter. It's just strengthening the system. Uh, I mean, I have never met a, a singer who has done too much yeah. breath work. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's look, such I'm a delicate, well, this is such a delicate thing for me to try to understand, you know, like I, it, like there's so much going on with that. And even like, I just think even like the jaw, you know, how's your jaw, like, you know, what, like, and yeah. yeah. And your tongue, you know, no, like what's that's that stuff? Something, yeah. That's something really interesting when you think about like mouth breathing and nasal breathing is okay. the tongue position, yeah, right? Yeah. And so you're usually a, a, a nasal breather, mm -hmm. your tongue will usually sit on your hard palate, right mm -hmm. up, up inside your mouth. And that's really cool because that's where we want it to be. Then yeah. usually you don't have any like big issues with your tongue root, mm -hmm. but many singers actually develop issues with their tongue or like they, where the tongue again gets into some kind of habits that aren't really efficient sure. and, and where the tongue all of a sudden is is not really independent from the jaw anymore so I, when i say that i mean if they say they have to do you know mm -hmm. like when the tongue goes up the jaw goes up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. they can't they can't do like that kind of stuff anymore and because the tongue root has somehow gotten used to being in one position and that's where it's used to be and then it just doesn't move move from there unless you really kind of train your brain it, it it's yeah. a lot of concentration and, yeah. and I, I like to really go into and i tell all my students that really we're not as much working on our tongue right now as we are actually brain. reprogramming 100%. things in our brain that's so cool and we are you know i like to speak of like highways and like little mountain paths. So I would say, look, your brain is used to go on that highway, yeah. right? Yeah. When there are some habits, when it's like an automatism of something. Sure. So it's it's used to always go on that highway and it became a highway because it's being used so much. Mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of taking a, a machete and we're kind of like opening up this kind of little trail. A little pathway. And so, yeah. 
Yes. And so in the beginning, of course, we'll have to always consciously have to choose that little trail because it's not as comfortable to use as the highway. For sure. But, it's a great but very often the views are better on the trail and very often in the end you get to your goal way faster. Oh, that's awesome. It's yeah. awesome. Do you find, do you find, I mean, obviously you've done a lot of work in this now and you, and you have some experience in it personally and then teaching. Do you find uh, new students who come to you and go, what is this about? Or are they pretty receptive with, as like time has gone on, you know? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think probably, I mean, when it comes to singers, usually the singers who come to me now are either professional singers or yeah. singers who already, who usually singers come to me who have issues. Yeah. And they kind of already know and, what they're getting probably, you know? No, they, they have no idea oh, what they're really? getting themselves into. And they're actually really thankful to work in a completely different way. I could see that for sure. I could see that entirely. You see, because usually teaching singing is still now is very often really the teacher telling the student how the student should feel something, how the student should um, do something that we can't see and that the teacher certainly can't feel or can't see. And so um, my way is much more, you know, really student centered. So it's all about what do you feel, what's happening and, and where do you feel it and what's going on. Ah, and so, so cool. getting, yeah, they, they might be taken a little bit back being like, whoa, yeah. and some of them are, are just not used to feeling anything, you know, and in the beginning they they might be a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. But, but usually they bear with me and they don't run away. <laughs> well, that's the new pathway. That's the new pathway. But I think that that's got to be so powerful to catch somebody in a professional career because they need that new advancement, you know, so and then they, they yeah. get to feel like a student again. I mean, at the end of the day, you like, like right now, I'm I feel like I study and pay attention and I teach a lot of breath work and I'm, I'm a big person of teaching myself these things. But I'm here learning things in an environment around something I love that I'm a student to, you know, so like watching. And that's why I told you before we even press play. One of the things that I love is you seem so creative and intuitive. And as I kind of hear your history and then now knowing some of the work that you put into it, you know, just a question. And I, we always ask people at the end, you know, their purpose and some standards. And, and I'll ask you that, too. But something that is really cool as I listen to you speak is you do and i've found this very familiar with a with a lot of i'm very fortunate to speak to people like yourself and on this po podcast but you sound very intuitive and creative and uh like assertive in what you're about to teach and what you're teaching which is awesome and i would love those traits as a as someone who was a student of yours which i essentially am right now but when you look at it like what, how much do you allow your intuition to like go out and try teaching things? And then maybe, maybe I'm like, oh, I maybe screwed that up, but that's okay. You know, like what's the fun part of your learning process while you're teaching it? Yeah, I'm, I'm always ready to say, hey, yeah. oops. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, awesome. I that's mean, awesome. look, I, I had this huge oops and I'm actually really sorry about this because it's not <laughs> my oops. And I, that's why I can't really start. own it. Yeah. You know, when I, when I started to work, well, when I trained in this Carl Stau method, okay. so this method based on Carl Stau, I asked my mentor, so when should we breathe through the nose and when should we breathe through the mouth? Mm -hmm. And I was taught um, that you should always breathe through your mouth, except when it's really cold, really hot, or the air is really polluted. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. now after years of telling people that they should breathe through their mouth, you know, uh, I'm kind of making, I'm making up for it. So that's like a big oops. Yeah. Okay. We did work on breath mechanics and even through the mouth, we always worked on like slower exhale. And yeah. so it wasn't really entirely wrong. Right. But you know, now that I know, oh, I, I was, oh, <laughs> sorry, really guys. Yeah. But you know, you know, we're all on a path, yeah. and we are like I don't ever, I don't think that I, I think I'm totally at the beginning of everything. Yeah, likewise. So I'm just, I'm just maybe like half a step further than the people that I'm teaching, and like I said before, so much of it is not yet evidence based. Like maybe. 
we'll have a we have a case study of something or you know maybe we have an experiment that we did on ourselves yeah and then we kind of try to teach that to somebody else it there's always the possibility that it doesn't work for everybody yeah. and we need to be open to that and that's why it's so important to be creative because sometimes you know you just kind of have this feeling that you know you understand the concept especially when it comes to voice or that whole pressure stuff mm -hmm. i understand the concept but yeah. how to make somebody else understand and not only understand it in their head but feel it in their body yeah you know? which is crucial you, that's awesome oh you have to be so creative because words are limiting mm -hmm. And not everybody perceives things in the same way Then I teach in many different languages. So yeah. there, every language then offers different possibilities of saying things, you oh, know, it's, sure. not the same. it's not the same in French or in Slovenian or in Italian, or it's just not the same. Right. That so, is wild. I've, I didn't even think about that. I was in Europe. I told you that I was in Europe a few months ago and it is because over here, I mean, I can go to Texas and everyone's speaking, you know, English. I can go to California. It's the same thing. That is a wild concept because now you're trying to learn their verbiage, their inside jokes, their inside language. And what a yeah. wild thing. That is so cool. I love how you uh, touch on creativity right there and that, that ability to just kind of intuitively think. And I think that'll kind of tee it up perfectly as we kind of center around we call it the diamond series so the diamond series is everyone's purpose or standards or systems and vision and so something again super cool to listen to you talk more so because i can literally feel the passion uh towards such a special thing for you're using singing and athletics as a platform but you're talking about health to a large large degree here and sure. and and the ability to improve as a person, which is which is why I reached out to you, and it's very fun to listen to you even deeper now. But when you think about the purpose and the the why behind what you're doing, the incentive to keep being wrong or study and learn and then get better and keep pushing, keep pushing, something we like to ask a lot of people is, what is worth struggling for, right? So when you think about yourself in terms of the purpose-driven methods and philosophies, and you think about the struggle, I can you hear me? Oh, sorry. You were, yeah, just yeah, you were cut off. I'll be able to edit that part. We got a, we're actually getting a storm here, which is just now happening. Oh. So yeah, it's pouring okay. outside my, my uh, window right now. But, uh, but the concept I was going at there was when you think about what's worth struggling for. So the ability to bring breath work into singing, bring breath work into athletics, bring breath work into uh, human performance, health, all these sort of things. When you think about what is worth struggling for, for you, that gives you a deep sense of purpose to keep pushing forward and helping and helping and serving. What comes to mind when you think of what that is that has really like sustained this ability to keep learning and then teach it to the best of your ability? It's the, 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 the idea of having really maximum efficiency in a system. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, it's awesome. Keep it's going. really, yeah. it's really to make people understand that their body is their partner and is their, it, it really, it's, it's a two way street, right? I mean, this, I think that, again, parallel between athletes and singers, sometimes they tend to just use their body mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not see it as the, as a partner and not try to understand that sometimes there are days when it's better not to push it, you know. And so to find that kind of efficiency, um, both mechanically, physiologically, and then, of course, also with a mental state, mm -hmm. that's what's worth struggling for, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is an epic answer. You know, when you think about yourself, so take yourself away from the student, take yourself away from the field, just put your, your own perspective of it. When you think about Barbara and your sense of your standards, mentally, emotionally, and physically, you know, what are things that you have to check off to make sure that you're optimizing your teaching, your philosophies? What are the things that you have to do? What's your personal breath work look like? What is your personal practices and singing and researching and reading and human connection, all those sort of things. What do you have to have so that you're able to go out and do that? I think I need to have a lot of trust in myself, mm. you know, just trust, not just the things that I know consciously, but the things that are just somewhere in the back of my mind, and then they'll just pop out in the right yeah. moment. And then to go with that and not question that, 
because as soon as you start questioning it then you're off but yeah. to really go with what you said before like intuition and just be like okay no that's what that person needs right now and maybe it's against everything that i said to the last person who was in there yeah, yeah. but you know it's definitely this kind of to trust myself i think that's what that's what breath work really helps me to connect to myself and to kind of find that inner that inner voice that mm. is as loud and clear as possible and sometimes it gets a bit cloudy because people like throw all sorts of stuff at us right yeah. and then you know are those mirror neurons who go Wee! but then you understand <laughs> yeah. what is them and what is me and how can i really continue to to hear myself and trust myself yeah and that's oh that's beautiful i mean that's where i think breath work really connects you with that right because you're so right on exactly. in terms of stimulation just the concept of mass stimulus all the time you know and so you know as you kind of take this forward and you've mentioned a lot about trying to speed up the process of breathing and, and this focus and specifically in the singing community and the athletic community and and doing that and obviously keep pushing forward and, and i can't wait to pass the torch of your work through this but when you think about the excitement, right? So the carrot out in front of you, what's the the vision of why I'm doing this, how I'm doing this, and then when I see the world that I would want to have or the the performance in which it would look, you know, what does that look like? What's that carrot like in your mind or your perception of the thing that you're chasing after? Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, take some time. That Oh my God, one one hour and now you're asking me questions like that that I would need to think about <laughs> yeah. for an hour. Yeah, and you got to late um, your end of the day now too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you're all burnt it's up. It's actually getting dark, yeah. So, you know what? You know what? My, my vision, the thing that's really where I'm like, ooh, that needs to be done <laughs> yeah. is to start working with children. Like, it's that's what's so important, you know, that children when they still have all of those abilities and they haven't lost their flexibility and all of yeah. this to then go in there and teach them and give them those tools. And I love all the stuff that David Bidler of like the physiology first and distance oh, yeah. project. Yeah. yeah, he does so much like youth education for, for young people who have mental illnesses. Wow. So I think that there, there's so much work to do. And yeah, I, I, I wrote a book about six years ago that is really aimed at very small children. Mm -hmm. So like from three to eight, it's like a, a picture book about sure. the importance of exhaling. And so I'm still waiting for the right moment to publish it, but I oh. think it's going to happen. Yeah. Good and then, you. and yeah, and with the book, there's also a song for little kids just to raise their awareness, sure. you know, about ribs and stuff. So I wrote the song and tons of exercises that teachers can use you know and in the beginning of a lesson for example how great would that be if they took three to five minutes in the beginning of like a math class yeah. and they would say hey you know what i can feel that you are kind of hyped today let's do three to five minutes of breath work yeah and yeah. Of course, not all the kids are going to jump on that immediately. But I think, you know, if this is something that is done repeatedly throughout our school time, it's at least something, it's a tool that we learn that we can always fall back on. And so, yeah, that would be my vision would be yeah. to, you know, teach the teachers how important breath work is and how it can be such an important tool for them to help the kids calm down, concentrate better. Um, and then how it can become a tool for the children yeah. and how then every like maybe communication would be easier and you know everybody's nervous system would be a bit more slow down chill. a little bit yeah chill out chill and i out. think especially especially in america i lived in america for a year when i was um, really young so long long, long uh, time there ago you go. there you go but, but um i think something that you have that we don't have so much here in Europe is the, like with all the school shootings and, yeah. you know, schools in America are not the same kind of chill place no. like they are here. Yeah. Here, you know, the kids walk in and out and, you know, they just, yeah, no, I was going to, I was going to finish it out with more. So just you giving a, a, a platform for people to find you. And then obviously I know that I'm in America, but it's uh, I still think that people who listen to it here, uh, we'll be able to grab a hold of what you're doing and kind of follow out a little bit. 
Yeah. I mean, anyway, everything is so international now and yeah. we can work so well online. 100%. Come say hi again. This is my younger son. What's going on, man? Hi. How are you? Good, you? I'm good. Are those some, you got some biking gloves on? Yeah. Oh, let's Yeah, he's, he's here. BMX, he just got back from the local pump track. Yes, let's go. I love it. Rocking the gloves. Yeah, no, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just ways. What are some ways that people can follow your work and your art and, and obviously dive into it? Because like I said, you've done uh, I'm over here and I've been I've been studying your stuff and in the balloons. Obviously, I use a lot of the balloons, too. And it's something where I do think that singing this is my first experience in the singing community. So more so I never know knew what you were talking about today. So like to me, I think ah. there's a way to correlate that into my teaching and my athletes and yeah. people that we do. And it's just about learning their language, right? How do I learn your language to take this pressurized deal? Maybe you don't need to be a professional singer, but we can use these same tactics to strengthen your breathing, your mobility. And that's, you know, that's, that's the part of learning. And so I can learn just as much from you, even if I've never sang before, you know, so exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the tools you do, a lot of the training you do, and a lot of the creativity, which I've, which I've talked a lot about, I think that that can be used across everybody on the planet really. But so for people to sure. learn more about what you're doing and then how to utilize that, how do I find you? How do we find you? So my website is www.voiceup.si. Oh, right on. So um, you can go there. We also actually have, but that's, I mean, for you Americans right now, that doesn't really come into question, but we also have uh, an apartment here close to our house. So we do breathing retreats. We have people who come oh, cool. here from abroad and then like do intensive courses with us. Oh, cool. And then we'll also include like barefoot walking and yes. we have a really cool, cool like gin distillery in our village so oh wow um, yeah so that can happen and our neighbor makes his own beer so you know it's not all super healthy but it's fun yeah yeah um so that's a there, there that's a possibility then of, i think i'm most active on instagram so that's bt underscore breathing coach on facebook it's barbara tanze um, breathing coach and if you want to hear me sing then I think the most fun thing to do is to um, go and check out the metal stuff that I'm doing. Oh, right on. So I'm singing, I'm singing in a metal band. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that metal band is called Aquilea. It's an Italian band. And uh, yeah, you can find that. You can find that on uh, YouTube. Wow. So it's Aquilea with a V A Q V I. L E A. Yeah, that'll and be I the have whole a... thing. <laughs> need the spell out for that one. <laughs> so sorry, go ahead. What else do you have going? So yeah. so yeah, that's I think right now what's going on. I really hope to publish that book sometime yeah. soon. As do I. But I hope you do. Congratulations on that too. So get it out there. But it's a big project. Yeah. It's a big project, you yeah. know, because I wanted to do a boy and a girl version. So it's going to be two books in one, you know, sure. one with a hero and one with a heroine. So it's sure. all, you know, gendered, yeah. not neutral, but it's for, yeah. So, yes. Big well, project. that is awesome. I, uh, Barbara, from myself and the in the rest of the Mindstrom crew, and then Dave Fisher's our Austrian guy, so he plays hockey over there. So if we can do anything, and next year we get sure. to go and see him, I'll, we'd love to come out and have some beers with the crew and do some breath work. So we'll uh, awesome. we'll have to come out and do some uh, some gin and then and the beer drinking with you guys and have a good time. But no, from my end, I just appreciate you giving up your time and and sharing this moment with me, and 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 obviously. I'm the one who does the interviewing and whatnot, but we have a lot of great people in the organization who, uh, you know, will listen to this and then we'll pass it out and share it and pass on the torch of what you're doing. And this was really insightful for me to learn. I've got some uh, homework to do and some practices, so I'll try to, I'll let you know how my progress is. Uh, but it's super cool, great. super cool to connect awesome. with you. And I know we'll stay connected and, and I'll keep uh, keep an eye out. And then I, again, look forward to passing on your work and, and best of luck as you keep moving through and, and helping the helping the world. So keep breathing on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. And it's uh, it's so generous of you to give a platform to people like me. So I, appreciate that. Um, I think that's what we're here for, yeah. you know, to share. And it's I mean, I love talking about this stuff. So it's really 
Yeah, it's pretty. It's, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Likewise. So, well, hey, I will. Uh, I'll talk to you soon again. Thanks for giving up your evening. Perfect setup. So rest down, down regulate, enjoy the family, and uh, and have a good evening. And then we will talk soon. Yeah, same to you. Have a good rest of your day. You still have a couple of hours left. Yeah, I'm gonna get after it. So, all right. Well, hey, we will talk to you soon.